Dear colleagues, in this lecture we discuss the extrathyroidal spread of the thyroid nodule. At the start of the lecture I raised the attention that this sign is challenging for experienced investigators and therefore could be even more problematic for a beginner. I suggest bearing in mind a basic rule. On the one hand, a nodule which does not show any other suspicious sign is only exceptionally spreads extrathyroidal. On the other hand, a great proportion of nodules present at least one of the signs which may suggest extrathyroidal extension. So this sign has a weak positive predictive value but a quite good negative one. In contrast with most other ultrasound characteristics, we have a biological standard to which our judgment can be compared to in surgical treated patients and this has great relevance in the establishment of the real potential of the sign. Be aware that in most ultrasound features we compare our opinion to the opinion of other colleagues while in the event of extraterrestrial extension we have the opportunity to compare our judgment to the reality. The third consideration relies on an existing contradiction. Extratidal spread is the only sign which can influence not only the further management of a patient, but according to the TNM classification, even the final clinical and histopathological staging. And this is an absolutely unique situation in thyroid ultrasound and imposes a very serious responsibility on the investigator. An examination performed at the very beginning of a newly diagnosed nodular goiter patient influences the histopathological staging after the removal of the nodule. In fact, ultrasound is not suitable for all of these tests in most cases. The theme will be discussed in two parts. Here in the basic lecture we focus on definitions and on the interpretation of ultrasound features. Then I try to deal with an important distinction. There are two ways in which the extratidal extension is discussed in the literature and guidelines, and it is often unclear what sense is ETA discussed. This sign can be used for predicting extratidal spread, and similarly to other features, it can be used for predicting malignancy irrespectively of an existing extension beyond the anatomical borders of the thyroid. Finally, I only briefly mention the role of extratidal spread in various classification systems and in the most frequent subtypes of thyroid cancer. So the topics. First I talk about two definitions. The first relies on the extension of extratidal growth of a tumor. These degrees are the very basis of the clinical staging of thyroid cancers. Minimal degree can be diagnosed only by microscopic analysis. In recognition of minimal degree of extratidal extension, ultrasound has good performance. Unfortunately, this relatively good diagnostic power has little importance because the presence of minimal degree of ETE has a role neither in clinical staging nor in the prognosis. Gross extratidal extension can be diagnosed either by preoperative radiology, ultrasound, MRI or CT scan, or by visual judgment of the tumor intraoperatively by the surgeon, or also by visual judgment of the specimen postoperatively by the histopathologist. If any three colleagues diagnose gross extraterrestrial extension, then the existence of ETE should be treated as a fact. This cannot be overwritten by a microscopic analysis because the latter has no role in its determination. We will deal with this in detail during the advanced course, but it is worth being aware of the responsibilities of ultrasound examination and examiner at this point. This time I only mention that none of the radiological methods is able to perform this task to an acceptable level all have only 50% positive predictive value in predicting gross extraterrestrial extension. This situation is made particularly serious by the fact that unlike the minimal extraterrestrial extension, the gross extraterrestrial spread fundamentally determines the clinical stage and prognosis. What are the ultrasound signs of a possible extraterrestrial growth? 
Basically, we can examine two phenomena, the integrity of the thyroid capsule and the contour of the nodule. There are three possibilities regarding the capsule. It can be continuous, discontinuous or invisible. Three types of contours exist. The nodule can be covered by normal thyroid tissue. If not covered by thyroid tissue, then the contour can be abutting and or bulging. Perhaps the most important consideration relies on nodules which are covered by normal parenchyma. In such cases, the likelihood of extratidal spread is practically zero. The possibility of extratidal spread can be considered if the capsule is discontinuous or invisible and the contour is abutting or bulging. These are the C possible ultrasound signs of extratidal extension. Let's see the first, the thyroid capsule. The capsule of a lobe is presented in the form of an echogenic line running ventral to the thyroid. Unfortunately, the thyroid does not have a real capsule, only a pseudocapsule. This pseudocapsule does not cover the entire thyroid gland, it only connects the thyroid to other organs of the neck. Consequently, a discontinuous pseudocapsule is a normal finding. Extratidal spread can be raised if the capsule is discontinuous and the contour is abutting. The discontinuation has no relevance if the nodule is covered by normal parenchyma. Due to anatomical reasons, it is very difficult to judge the capsule at the lateral and the dorsal part of the thyroid, while due to technical reasons, this is almost impossible in the medial part where the trachea runs. Let's see how a regular pseudocapsule looks like. In most cases, the capsule can be examined in the ventral and the dorsal surface of the lobe. Note the echogenic line running ventral to the thyroid. The brightness depends both on the thickness of the connective tissue and on technical circumstances. The pseudocapsule is normally broken at several places. These are signed with yellow arrows and can be absent at larger parts, see the surface between the red arrows. The situation is demonstrated on enlarged view. Upper the transverse, lower the longitudinal scans are presented. We can see that the capsule has broken in several places yellow arrows, while completely absent in a relatively large part of the ventral surface. On the longitudinal scan, only thinning of the capsule can be seen. As in most cases, the dorsal borders are more difficult to judge. The pseudocapsule cannot be identified in the medial and lateral borders of the lobe. From a practical point of view, the absence of capsule in the medial part is the most important one. This is caused partly by the anatomical situation. The cartilaginous wall of the trachea hinders the propagation of the ultrasound wave. Consequently, one of the most frequently occurring forms of gross extratidal spread when a tumor breaks into the trachea cannot be judged on ultrasound in most cases. This is illustrated by these images. The right patient had a parathyroid cancer which broke into the trachea but we have no direct proof for this. The left papillary cancer did not present extratidal extension. Essentially, there is no difference in the ultrasound patterns between these two cases regarding the medial borders of the tumors. In certain cases, the discontinuation of the capsule can be very alarming. Note that the capsule is intact all along the ventral surface of the lobe, except for the part where the nodule is in contact with the ventral border of the lobe. Red arrows show the intact, while yellow do the broken parts of the pseudocapsule. The second sign is the abutting contour. It means that the nodule is in close contact to the outer surface of the lobe. The issue is that a nodule located at the edge of the thyroid is a very common phenomenon. Therefore, we speak about abutment if it exceeds a certain value. The perimeter of the abutting part of the nodule has to be compared to the perimeter of the entire nodule. There is no universally accepted degree of abutment, we 
it should be had as pathological. It seems self-evident that higher the ratio of the perimeter contacts with the adjacent capsule, higher the likelihood of extratidal spread. The overall accuracy of abutment is far from the ideal. The issue is that great proportion of non-spreading cancers and benign lesions are adjacent to the capsule of the thyroid. On the other hand, the lack of abutment has a huge negative predictive value. In these cases, the nodules lie at the ventral surface of the nodule and there is no thyroid parenchyma between the ventral surface of the lobe and that of the nodule. In other words, the contours of these nodules are abutting. These images present how to calculate the extent of abutment. The two endpoints of the abutting part of the ventral wall of the nodule are marked with white arrowheads, here and there. We have to relate the perimeter, in other words the arc of the nodule, this part here, which is in contact with the nodule surface, to the perimeter of the lesion. The perimeter is that one. There is another mode to calculate this ratio. To compare the diameters of the abutting part of the nodule with the largest parallel diameter of the lesion seems to be easier. So if we compare this distance with that distance. Following the rule of geometry, the half of this ratio corresponds to the ratio of perimeters. Taking the diameter instead of perimeter into account has an advantage in lesions which present abutment in oblique sections. This situation is presented in the right case. The abutting perimeter ratio is lower than 10% of this nodule. So this ratio, if we compare this arc to the arc of the entire nodule, but if we compare uh, the diameters, the distance between these arrows and these arrowheads, then the diameter quotient, quotient is between 25 and 50 percent, which can be considered as a positive finding. So the angle should be considered in such nodules, it means that parallel diameters should be measured. Bulging is a special form of abutment. Bulging contour means that the nodule protrudes into anatomical structures outside the thyroid. Naturally, this is a more serious sign. However, even benign nodules might present bulging. We present here two examples. Both epillary cancers presented bulging contours. The red arrows in the right case point to intact parts of the thyroid capsule while yellow arrows due to the most protruding to the most bulging part of the tumor. This table summarizes the possible combinations of ultrasound presentations of capsule and contour with the related risk of extratidal spread. We should consider the risk of extratidal extension if the capsule is discontinuous and the nodule presents at least a batting contour. If such nodule does not show bulging, then the risk of gross ETE is low, while if it bulges, then gross extension cannot be excluded. So there is a real risk of gross ETE if the nodule presents all three signs of a possible extratidal growth. Both nodules present abutting and bulging contours. The yellow arrows here and there point to the most dorsal and the most ventral part of the non-nodular tissue, left and right cases respectively. Or in other words, yellow arrows show the point where the nodule starts protruding. The difference between the cases relies on the presentation of the capsule. In the left benign nodule, the capsule marked with red arrows is continuous while in the right malignant case, the capsule is discontinuous. In the next part of the lecture, we focus on the different meanings of extratidal spread. The ETE is used in two different senses in the literature and guidelines. The first is when we suggest extratidal spread, and 
the second is used in the context of suspicious characteristics when on the signs of ETE we suggest malignancy. Although it seems to be a bit confusing, but this distinction is indeed not meaningless. The three kinds of the North American pirates include ultrasound signs of ETE among suspicious characteristics. It means that in these systems the pirate score is influenced by these signs. There are two guidelines, these are the European and the Korean pirates, which use extraterrestrial spread for prediction of existing extraterrestrial spread, and these guidelines suggest FNA if the nodule is suspicious spreading extraterrestrial irrespectively of the pirate score. These classification systems, however, do not enlist ultrasound signs of extraterrestrial spread among suspicious characteristics. Regarding the first, that is, the prediction of extraterrestrial spread, the over-accuracy of ultrasound is very far from ideal. We will deal with this problem in the advanced course. Here I only tell the conclusion of the literature data. The positive predictive value of ultrasound in judging the extraterrestrial spread is only 50%. The real value of judging the extraterrestrial spread is the more than 95% negative predictive value. In contrast with all other suspicious ultrasound characteristics, there are very limited data in the literature regarding the use of ETE to predict malignancy. Indeed, only two papers deal with this. Yun and co-workers have found a similar diagnostic value of ETE signs as in other suspicious characteristics in the event of medullary cancer. The other is our recent work. This study demonstrated a lower sensitivity, but a better specificity and positive predictive value of ultrasound signs of ETE in predicting thyroid cancer. I only mention that a great proportion of the cases when the tumor spread extraterrestrial belonged to the minimal type of extraterrestrial growth. I move to the next topic the occurrence of extraterrestrial spread in the most frequent subtypes of thyroid cancer. This huge American database included more than 240,000 surgical treated patients. The occurrence of extraterrestrial spread was lower than in most papers published in the literature. This might be explained by the difference in skills of an average and of a highly experienced evaluation group. Nonetheless, the table demonstrates the real situation and it is suitable to compare the extraterrestrial spread in different subtypes of thyroid cancers. So, more than 10% of papillary and medullary thyroid cancers presented with extraterrestrial spread, while this figure was much lower in the event of follicular cancer. Regarding gross extension, papillary cancers account for 4% and medullary cancers for 5%. To summarize, the rate as TNM classification assigns a role to preoperative radiology, including ultrasound, that it is unable to do for objective reasons. Given the existing 50% positive predictive value for gross extraterrestrial extension, we simply cannot rely on ultrasound. Although ultrasound has a much better positive predictive value for detecting microscopic form of extraterrestrial extension, but this form does no more influence the clinical staging. Indeed, the real role of ultrasound is the exclusion of extraterrestrial spread. The three possible signs of ETA are used not only for diagnosing ETE, but similarly to other suspicious characteristics, also to predict thyroid cancer. In this field, again, not the diagnosis, but the exclusion is what for these signs are very useful. Considering these facts and data, two consequences can be drawn from these. First, if a nodule is suspicious spreading extraterrestrial, FNA is mandatory. Second, considering the low positive predictive value, a very careful wording is very important in ultrasound reports. Finally, I enlist in this table the used literature data. Thank you very much for your attention.